Well, our intro was a little delayed there. I have to work on that. But welcome back to uh, Why Do You Believe, the podcast of Southern Evangelical Seminary. And this is actually Why Do You Believe Live. So we're, we're trying to do some of these uh, live podcasts uh, every now and again on some relevant uh, apologetic and philosophical and theological issues. So thank you for joining us uh, if you're watching this later. Thank you for watching. Uh, so today we want to uh, talk about why in the world should the average Christian care about some heady topic like apologetic methodology, how we go about defending the faith. And to do that with us today, I want to bring in our guest, Dr. Richard G. Howe. Dr. Howe, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Adam, for putting this all together. Uh, well, it's always a pleasure to have you, and uh, I forgot to throw my little lower third up there, but I'm Adam Tucker uh, with Southern Evangelical Seminary. If you don't know who I am, if you haven't seen our show already, uh, Dr. Howe is one of our regular guests, a, a good friend and mentor. There you go. Branding. We, we paid thousands of dollars for that product placement. Right, that product placement there. <laughs> so Dr. Howe's been a longtime uh, professor with Southern Evangelical Seminary uh, in the areas of apologetics and philosophy and someone I'm proud to call a friend and, and mentor. So once again, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us, Dr. Howe. More fun doing this, probably more the fun than we're supposed to have. <laughs> 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 well, before we really get into the topic today, I want to take just a moment to uh, remember uh, Ravi Zacharias, who went home to be with the Lord uh, just over, I guess, what, 36 hours ago or, or so uh, at this point. Uh, tremendous uh, defender of the faith, tremendous evangelist, uh, someone that was actually partially trained by uh, our co-founder, uh, Dr. Norman Geisler, and uh, your your own mentor, Dr. Howe. Uh, but any, any thoughts you would like to offer uh, about Ravi and, and his legacy? Well, you know, just seeing the reaction that has uh, you know, poured out over the world, actually, uh, just shows you, even if we uh, if we ever started to doubt this, it just we were reminded how tremendous an impact that Ravi had on the world. You know, and I think there's still aspects of his impact that we probably are still unaware of that people aren't at liberty to say. Uh, he had audiences with heads of states around the yeah. world that he couldn't probably talk about publicly without jeopardizing those very opportunities. And so time and eternity will tell the fallout and the repercussions of how God used him in these strategic places through his lifetime. So uh, it wouldn't have mattered when he died. It would have been too soon for us as far as uh, the how much he means to us. So our prayers not only go out to his family, but also to the ministry. Um, I can't imagine a ministry that's built so much around his uh, presence uh, what they can think to do. They've got a lot of talent there. So it's really a matter of what kind of uh, contours and profile are they going to adapt in his in his absence. But they definitely have a lot of talent at RZIM, and they are more than equipped to carry the baton on and his legacy on. So we praise God for RZIM as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we were privileged to have him speak uh, at our national conference a couple of years ago. And uh, that was the first time I'd ever met him. And, and of course, you know, when we're, we're dealing with his assistants and all that, when we're booking him and uh, I was standing at our SES booth talking to a prospective student, you know, doing my job as a recruiter. And uh, somebody came over and said, hey, uh, we need you over here for just a minute. And I you know, I didn't know what they needed. I was talking to a prospective student. I said, OK, sure. Just a moment. I'll be I'll be right there. So I finished my conversation and turned around and there's Robbie. Was, ah, <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for being here. So that was a, a interesting way to, to meet him for the first time, but it was really cool having him at the conference. Yeah. And he was a sweet man uh, outside the camera and off the stage, like he came across on camera and on the stage. So uh, what you saw is what you got with him. A great, a great man of virtue. And of course we are, uh, doing this from our homes. Everyone's still working from home, so you may see little heads pop in and out and people talking, and uh, we'll try to keep that to a minimum uh, here as we try to get through this live stream. Here at my end, let me know. Cause <laughs> I think I'll have a heart attack if some little head comes popping in. 
<laughs> All right, so let's set the stage for uh, what we want to talk about today. So a couple of weeks ago, you and I had the uh, privilege of speaking to a couple of uh, brothers from the Tag Your It podcast, uh, Dave and uh, Ray Ray. And it was a pleasure. They, they were very gracious. Uh, we had a good time and just kind of a free-flowing dialogue, uh, which I thought was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, we chased a lot of rabbits and uh, so much more ground that, that uh, all of us wanted to cover. Uh, but if you missed that discussion on uh, inerrancy and philosophy and uh, apologetic method and, and how all that fits together, uh, you can go to the SES YouTube channel uh, and check that out, or it's also archived on our uh, Facebook page as well. Uh, it was about a two-hour conversation. And uh, actually, you can download our SES mobile app if you want to just have the audio and not, not worry about the video as a, as a podcast uh, on there. So, you know, they've released a couple of podcasts since then, uh, just as follow up and, and kind of recapping our conversation. Uh, we've done a blog or two uh, about the, the conversation as well. But, uh, you know, we want to do our own recap and, and revisit some things. So we're going to play a few audio clips and uh, just some different things today to, to talk about some points that we might want to dive a little deeper into. And uh, this probably won't be the only time we do this because there's so much ground uh, that needs covering. Uh, so before we, so Adam, we can, can we can we you yep. be add and I'll be rich rich. Oh, hey, that sounds good. That'll work. That'll work. <laughs> so before we get into the audio clips and those sorts of things, uh, just for the sake of our audience. Can you explain to us a bit about what exactly we mean by apologetic method and and these different uh, methods of defending the faith? What what does that mean? Well, um, it is a yeah, it is a way. It's an, a, a way of uh, how to do apologetics. And really, I think there are two dimensions that every method tries to uh, explain about itself. One is a principled aspect in terms of what they think. Scripture uh, indicates how we should defend the faith. Maybe sound reason may dictate if you think there's a viable place for uh, human reason in this equation. So the principal argument is one. And then there's this practical uh, in terms of, well, this is counterproductive or this is a better way to do it. Now, the problem with the practical side is I think all hands would agree that when it comes to the increase, that's really up to the Lord. So I think there's a parallel in some respects between how we do apologetics and then how we do evangelism. Suppose instead of apologetics and defending the faith, we were here talking about how do you do evangelism? It's likely that few Christians would bring up the question, well, why should we bother? Because I think most Christians are, are keenly aware of the mandates from Scripture to, uh, to share the gospel and make disciples uh, of the whole world. Uh, well, if you could think of different ways to do evangelism. You know, should you pass out tracts on the street corner? Should you go door to door? Should you have big tent events and, and bring people, lost people in? Should it be friendship evangelism? Uh, these kinds of things. There, there is a sort of a parallel discussion and debate over how you defend the faith. So there, there are small, it's really just a small group or option, number of options regarding the different methods and some of the distinctions between some of the methods are fairly minimal. They're sort of not trivial necessarily, but they're sort of shades and variations on a theme. Other distinctions between them are supreme and cavernous and to the point of mutually exclusive. So I sometimes break out in a rash when people say, well, I just kind of picked the best of all of the methods. I go... You can't pick the best of the methods that said you should never use a Big Ten event to evangelize and the methods that said you should always use a Big Ten event to evangelize. You can't pick the best of both of those because they're mutually exclusive. They're contrary points of view. So I think there are contrary elements within some of the uh, or at least among some of the methods. And that's the that's what constitutes this conversation and, and debate. So we specifically want to uh, talk about the difference between classical apologetics, which is what we advocate for at uh, SES, versus uh, presuppositionalism or presuppositional apologetics. Now, Dave and Ray Ray like to uh, classify that as covenantal apologetics. So is there a uh, nuanced understanding to be had there between presuppositionalism versus covenantal? 
Well, uh, as far as I can see, th- there's not, at least there's, there's not the intention to be a difference, uh, e- except maybe in this respect. When Scott Oliphant sort of inaugurated this effort, uh, it's a modest effort. He's not willing to die on, in, on, a, in a, on the hill for this necessarily, but he advocated that the covenantal title would allow the conversation to embrace more aspects of the reform theology with respect to uh, the question of apologetic systems. It's not that his mentor, uh, Van Til, didn't do that. But I think uh, Scott saw his enterprise as more or less translating Van Til into, into more biblical sounding language. Not that Van Til wasn't biblical, he would argue. It's just that sometimes the, the method of the uh, explaining his presuppositionalism, Van Til, might appear a little obtuse to some people. There's a lot of reasons for that. But anyway, that's what that's what Oliphant's project was. And so I don't think he sees it as any kind of modification. It's just perhaps a, you know, a new international version versus the old King James version uh, translation uh, of the method. But, you know, it, I'll let them settle how they can call themselves whatever they want. I, it's hard for me to get out of the habit of calling it presuppositional ism because that's just been around for most of its life. And certainly since it came on my radar screen in the in the 70s, when I first started reading uh, Van Til. But it, but it is curious to me, and I'd love to ask Scott or someone else, why they don't think there's the danger that calling it covenantal apologetics would be an affront to their fellow covenant theologians who are not presuppositional. I'm thinking of people like R. Allen Killen, who was professor of apologetics at at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, or R.C. Sproul, or, or uh, John Gerstner, or for that matter, the, the Princeton Giants, or the Puritans, like Charnock and Owen and, and uh, Turretin, or John Calvin, if you will, or Jesus. No, 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 I won't go, I won't go that far. Um, but in other words, there are a number of covenant theologians who see the classical apologetics approach is completely consistent with their covenant theology. So I'd, I'd just be curious if they thought, well, uh, that would be like me. You know, I'll, I won't try to come up with an analogy because maybe the point is, is clear enough on its own. There are covenant theologians who aren't uh, presuppositional. So, uh, but at any rate, there, there's really no difference uh, that, that I've been able to see. Gotcha. I appreciate that clarification. So uh, with all of these distinctions and these big words we're throwing around and isms and this, that, and the other, why in the world should the average Christian care about these distinctions, specifically as it relates to to classical apologetics versus presuppositionalism? Yes. Well, you know, uh, the accusations, if I may use that term, can get pretty serious because certain presuppositionalists indict classical apologists and classical apologetics as being in contrary to uh, God's word. So we are, in effect, sinning by doing this. We are compromising the truths of the gospel, and we are getting in God's way, so to speak. They don't use that expression necessarily, of how God has set up this engagement the way it should be done. And so they argue that their position not only is biblical in the sense that you you see it in their view, you see it modeled in Scripture, but they often say it's biblical in the sense that it arises from their Reformed theology, uh, so that their view of the noetic effects of sin, fall, uh, the the nature of man vis-a-vis the nature of God, as man is a creature, the nature of God in terms of the uh, precondition of all knowledge and these kind of things necessitate this particular method known as presuppositionalism. So both practically and principally, they would indict the classical method. Now, I have to add, while I'm thinking about it, lest we forget, there are different schools of presuppositionalism. Uh, uh, Most notably would be Gordon Clark versus Cornelius Van Til. So I'm not going to try to referee their debates. And you've got other things like uh, Francis Schaeffer, and his disciples, and then Carl Henry, and and, uh, and, and then there's uh, John Frame, and perhaps Richard Pratt, although I think Pratt's pretty brilliant. So you've got these sort of denominations within the presuppositionalist camp, and I'm not going to cast aspersions on those who are loyal to Van Til just because there are these other versions. 
in a similar kind of way, there are various denominations among classical apologists, at least self-identified classical apologists. So I tried to emphasize the night of our dialogue with uh, with Dave and Ray Ray that you and I more specifically were Thomists philosophically, which meant we uh, followed the, the uh, classical philosophical tradition of Aristotle as modified, qualified, augmented by Thomas Aquinas, philosophically speaking, whatever that ends up meaning. That's the stripe of classical that we feel obligated to defend. So I say that sort of as a preemptive, lest the objection gets raised, well, classical apologists do X, Y, Z, and you and I go, yeah, but Thomas don't do X, Y, Z. And I can't, and I'm with you. I think X, Y, Z is a bad thing. So there may be things that they would criticize classical apologists, apologists for doing that we would criticize them as well, just as there may be certain things some presuppositionalists do that they would probably criticize those presuppositionalists for doing so. Kind of, uh, we've all got our dirty laundry, so to speak. That's probably not a good metaphor. <laughs> but, uh, but nevertheless, there, there are variations. I only feel obligated to defend our view that I know you and I are in cahoots about, and that is sure. the, this Thomistic stripe of classical philosophy, which undergirds our classical apologetics. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Uh, so it can get pretty complicated, but uh, I, for me at least, the reason I, I get so passionate about this is uh, because, frankly, the ideas that I'm convinced are assumed within presuppositionalism, which we'll get into a few of those uh, today, uh, really make the whole evangelism enterprise bankrupt. Uh, I'm convinced it can only lead to skepticism or Fideism, just blind faith, uh, neither of which are biblical. And uh, of course, most presuppositionalists would deny that charge, uh, which, you know, again, is something uh, for debate. But that's why I get so passionate about it is if you really take these ideas to their logical conclusions, you're going to have tremendous implications on how you go about uh, evangelizing the lost and defending the faith, whether that be uh, against objections or whether that be answering questions from believers, especially young people. Uh, and uh, the way the, that presuppositionalism goes about it and the ideas, like I said, that, that are ingrained within it uh, are just bankrupt, in my opinion. And, and well, I, In fact, I hope that if, uh, uh, unless you're wanting to do that right now, I hope we come back to this point. You may be just teeing up a few of the uh, things that we're going to get into but I hope we don't forget, because I want to hear you unpack that some more of how serious an, uh, 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 an observation that is in terms of, of uh, well, they're, they're setting things up in such a way that they're uh, showing the inconsistency of the contrary right. becomes impossible uh, because they can only do that by conceding the very classical apologetics that they keep denying. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so maybe we'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah, we definitely want to get to that. Um, so you mentioned R.C. Sproul earlier, and he is, you know, one of those guys who uh, is very reformed uh, in, in his theology, but w debated against Bonson and, and others regarding presuppositionalism. So he was a, a classical apologist in the stripe of Thomas Aquinas philosophically. Uh, so we would very much uh, have that in common with him. And, you know, many people have said this, but he was the first one I remember hearing it from that, that kind of popularized this notion that the, the heart can't embrace what the mind doesn't think is true, which seems very commonsensical on the face of it. Uh, so I mentioned that in our dialogue uh, with uh, Dave and Ray Ray. And so uh, I think it was Ray Ray made a meme on their Facebook page. And he uh, you know, repeated that quote, the heart can't embrace what the mind doesn't think is true. And then said, but it's the heart that needs to be changed so that the mind can be renewed. What do you, what do you make of that? So this is an important, I think, point of confusion. Uh, I mentioned R. Allen Killen a few minutes ago. He's a name that probably isn't well known in the greater evangelical community. If, you, if you're familiar with what used to be the two-volume Wycliffe Bible Encyclopedia, eventually got uh, reduced uh, in terms of the type of paper and stuff to physically one volume, about half of that Wycliffe Bible Encyclopedia was written by R. Allen Killen. He was an amazing... Uh, soldier for the cause of Christ, but it was very much under the radar. And by the way, just as an aside, just so you can appreciate 
uh, the, 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 the virtue of a man like he. Uh, Killen studied under G.C. Burkauer, who was a famous theologian and who wrote a m massive multi-volume systematic theology, who Burkauer at some point in his ministry became liberal. And Killen was a student of Burkauer when that happened to Burkauer. And then Killen then more or less started to getting stumbled in his faith towards liberalism and away from the inerrancy of the Bible. And in, in his office one day, the two of us sitting down, he shared with me his testimony and his 10 year trek to come back to affirming the, the uh, inerrancy and infallibility of the scriptures and then went on to champion that. And that was one of the reasons why he invited me to his office, because at that time in my life, as a brand new Christian, I was stumbling over liberalism and inerrancy as well. So he really ministered to me. And he wrote a treatise on uh, apologetics comparing basically the uh, presuppositionalist and the non-presuppositionalist. What I don't even know if it was necessarily called classical at that time. Uh, even Sproul sometimes called it the analytic method uh, of, of apologetics. But Killen put his finger, I think, on a confusion that uh, Van Til had. And maybe confusion is not the right word. It was literally confusion is to fuse two things together in the wrong way. So it is etymologically a confusion. And it's this. It's the difference between what might what one might call a fact. Let's say the sky is blue. That's just a fact of reality. And then on the other hand, what one may recognize as a as a, as a human's moral reaction to that fact and the moral significance of that fact. And both of those are relevant. They're both theologically important and they're both apologetically important. And, but I, what I think it, Ray Ray is doing is the very thing that Killen criticized Van Til for doing is that he conflates those two. So at the same time that he rightfully indicts the fallen man as being in rebellion against God because of the way he reacts to the facts, he inadvertently then casts aspersions on the status of fact itself. Uh, and those have to be distinguished. They're not always easy to distinguish, practically speaking, but, but they are in reality two different things. There's a difference between the fact that the sky is blue and then how a lost man does or doesn't respond to the fact that the sky is blue. And so when you talk about the, the heart can embrace what, uh, um, I forget how you work. What, what the mind doesn't think is true. Yeah. yeah. What the mind doesn't think is true. There you're talking about what the mind thinks is true in terms of just fact, not what, what the heart finds uh, attractive, morally speaking. Mm -hmm. Of course, the heart can never embrace what the person in his heart is rebelling against. Of course, that's the case. That, that's where the work of the Holy Spirit comes in. That's never been the function of apologetics. Right. And by that, and, and by the same token, that's never been the function of evangelism, has it? Evangelism <laughs> doesn't change anybody. It doesn't impart faith. It merely confronts people with a message that that very message carries with it. Also, this moral dimension, namely, you are a sinner, uh, stand condemned before God, and your only hope for redemption is to uh, trust God uh, for what he uh, d has done for you through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the solution. Because so that's an affront to to uh, to the lost man without the work of the Holy Spirit to draw us. OK, that that's all fine. That doesn't really distinguish the two camps. So, you know, by the way, I, I have the quote from uh, from Killen. He says the heart of Van Til's argument centers around the word fact. The word has two specific meanings that can be used to express an event in history or a phenomenon in science or to express the meaning of the event. There is this moral significance. That's what Killen goes on in his book. And I, we can give people in a in some kind of description, if you want, where they can find that uh, fuller quote. But I, I think Killen is right. And I think Ray Ray uh, is just confusing those two uh, dimensions, the fact as fact. It just is a fact that the sky is blue. It just is a fact that two plus two equals four. And even in, 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 and here's another thing that sort of blurs the conversation. Just by me saying it's a fact will cause some hairs on the back of the, some necks of some presuppositionalists to stand up. 
because they're going to say, yeah, 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 but you can't concede the fact that it is a fact to the lost man. Well, what they are what they are trying to emphasize is they want to remind us, look, the lost man in principle will always rebel against these facts. Well, I don't know that that's even true because you find examples of people who are lost that don't rebel against these facts, like Cornelius, for example, like uh, um, uh, like the way various sermons and acts describe those whose heart was right towards God, who, who uh, God was not a respecter of person, these kinds of things. Now, we could say, well, that's only because of the Holy Spirit. Say, fine. But the point remains some facts aren't facts against which every lost person always rebels. I don't think two plus two is. I don't think the sky is blue is. So all we're saying, I know, Adam, I'm talking too long here. Uh, but all we're saying is that there are some facts that cert- that human beings cannot fail to know. They can't deny them at the risk of just sheer irrationality, like two plus two is four in base 10 arithmetic. Or, or the sky is blue on a sunny day, unless they're blind. Physically. Right. So uh, we can't fail to know certain facts. We can explore, well, what are some more of these facts that are relevant to the apologetic test? But whatever we end up arguing those are, we start with those facts. By the way, just to get one more thing out onto the table, those facts are th- basically truths we know about reality. So another thing that the that that I hear Dave and Ray Ray repeat over and over again, and I, maybe they get this from some other classical apologists. I, I don't know, but let me just be very very clear and direct as I as we tried to be that night. The starting point for classical apologetics, at least of our stripe of Thomism, is not reason. We don't start with reason. We start with the external, physical, sensible world. That's where all knowledge begins, because even by the time people are talking about starting points, they've already been knowing the world around them since they were born. Right. They've already started. They can't 10 years, 15, 20 years down the road, start studying apologetic and then start looking around for a starting point. Right. They've already been us. They've already started. They've been going for decades in their life of knowing the world around them through what they see, hear, taste, touch or smell. We would argue as Thomas that we could start with what people see, hear, taste, touch, or smell. There's a tree here. This is a dog. You're a human. And from those, prove the God, the only true God there is, which is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can prove that or demonstrate, if people like that word better, through uh, through sound reason. That's what that's what we say we're doing. Now you can still take an objection to that, but please stop saying. So they always want to start with reason, and and the presuppositionalist wants to start with God's word. No, yeah. we don't start with reason or with the self or with the self. That's even worse. Yeah, thank you. That's even worse because that is flagrant Cartesian philosophy. Yep. Which we can get into that maybe. There, that plagues a lot of contemporary conversation presuppositionalists. Yep. They're so they're so awash in the problems of modern contemporary Cartesian and other types of philosophy that they're running around to trying to correct problems that don't need correcting because they're pseudo problems in philosophy. Yep. So exactly. I don't get started on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- this is uh, no, 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 it's great. This is somewhat related uh, because this whole idea of neutrality uh, and, and having to, to have this neutral standpoint, if we actually want to know things and uh, sinful man and, and redeemed man uh, have different points of view. So there is no neutrality between the two. It, that's a big ongoing kind of talking point uh, within presuppositionalism. So in our, in our, di- our original dialogue, uh, Ray Ray said the following, and hopefully this clip will, uh, will work here spoke to Nicodemus in John 3, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it, so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. So scripture proclaims, their, um, scripture proclaims, therefore, that not only is there non-neutrality among those um, in Adam, there can never be neutrality for those in Adam by their own terms. Could you hear that on your end okay? Not at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I didn't want to interrupt it because I, I was thinking maybe somebody else is hearing it. No, yeah, it, it, it's playing through the live stream as far as I know anyway. No one's saying they haven't heard it yet. Uh, so basically it's the idea that uh, since Adam, there is no neutrality to be had uh, whatsoever uh, when it comes to uh, being able to think rightly about the spiritual things uh, and the gospel and, and so on and so forth. So uh, what what is this whole notion of neutrality all about and, and how is it that, that our classical view, specifically our Thomistic view, uh, kind of differs from, from that understanding? Well, uh, of course, the idea of neutrality, I mean, suggests the kind of concepts of belligerence and hostility. I mean, you could, you know, during World War II, you know, Iceland was neutral as a country, meaning they didn't take sides. And so in, in this context, uh, neutrality uh, must mean that there's no such thing as, as the lost. Uh, there's no such thing as the lost man being sort of indifferent one way or the other with respect to the truths of God that that by virtue of being lost, the lost man has already chosen against God. I don't really have a problem with that as a general principle in, in uh, theologically. I think that's that's what we mean by the lost man. Is I mean, First John five nineteen says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And in Matthew twelve, Jesus talks about if you're not for me, you're against me. Even though in other places he said if you're not against me, you're for me more or less. Like in uh, in Luke, uh, I think Luke chapter nine. Uh, so I don't have a problem with the idea that there are there are there's at least some things out there that about which we are not neutral. The, the debate is over re, instead whether or not that's the case of every truth that can be stated about the world, like two plus two equals four uh, is two plus two equals four in base 10 arithmetic. Is that neutral in the sense that? There, there's no reason to think that a lost man will consider that an affront in some way in which the saved man does not. Well, certainly, if you start unpacking that to the point that you finally get to a cosmological argument to explain that, well, mathematics only reflects the nature of created things and created things point to a creator. And, the, you know, then all of a sudden you get into these, quote, spiritual truths. But I think they're too careless to just throw that indictment about how the loss will be with respect to spiritual truths in terms of a person's moral standing before God versus how the lost man finds himself as a member of the creation of God. And in an odd kind of way, I think the, their God is too small because in their view, the fall has so adversely affected uh, God's creation that God can't even get to these people by means of the very creation in which he situated all human beings, knowing that we were going to fall. He can't do that anymore. So now you can't use any kind of reason or argument. That's an affront. That's a, a violation of the, you know, man, there's nothing neutral, blah, 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 blah. So you can't give argument. Can't. I go, well, well, yeah, you can, actually. I think God is so sovereign that he, that there's nothing about his creation that the lost man, or let me let me back up. The, God is so sovereign that there are uh, aspects of His creation that the lost man cannot excuse himself from, can't exit. I mean, I don't mean excuse himself morally. I mean, say uh, that he doesn't acknowledge. There are truths that he cannot fail to know. I don't care how lost he is, unless and in the event of our our very faculties that God gave us to know his creation have themselves been uh, uh, damaged or, or taken away. And even in that sense, God is sovereign enough to give a blind man eyes to see a blue sky if that's what God wants him to do. So I think there's a certain irony here that we have a view of God that going, no, there's no place the lost man can stand. I don't care how rebellious he is against God. There's no place he can stand in his entire creation that doesn't from that point where he's standing uh, we are able, as classical apologists, to take that point that he can't deny he's standing on and demonstrate the existence of the God of the Bible. That's what that's what we do as classical apologists. And another irony here, Adam, I, again, I, I'm bringing up a lot of points, each one of which uh, it deserves to be unraveled. So I'll leave it to you to stop me or say, let's come back to that. But um, but very often in, in, in listening to presuppositionalists, including Ray Ray and Dave, uh, they will very often 
point out something we're doing that's that's almost the very essence of classical apologetics. And they'll go, see, they're being presuppositional. They're showing how you can't have morality without God. <laughs> that's what the classical method does. <laughs> I mean, maybe they haven't read very much classical apologists. Right. Uh, I don't mean maybe they haven't read very much classical apologists when they talk about classical apologetics. Yeah. I'm talking about maybe they haven't read very much classical apologists defending the faith. And when you see there, a lot of the things that they think are classically or not classically are essentially presuppositional. Like James Anderson accused me of this in a, uh, in a re response he wrote to the, our debate that we had back in 2013 with Scott Oliphant and Jason Lyle. And in the journal, he, he I made some reference to the fact, well, I believe the earth is young because uh, because I think that's what the scriptures teach. And he said, how presuppositional is him? I go, it's not presuppositional. That's just exegetical. Presuppositional is when you insist that a person has to presuppose the 66, the God of the 66 books, the Trinitarian God of the 66 books of the Protestant Reformed Bible. It has to be that attenuated. You have to presuppose that before you can know anything. Well, I wasn't saying that. I was just saying I think the Bible teaches from Genesis that the earth is young. I mean, that's just normal exegesis. Yet they, they, they go, see, they're being presuppositional. And that happened in the most recent podcast when they pointed out something that I said. And they go, yeah, you know, he's being presuppositional. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Not at all. I mean, yeah. No, we're, we're going to get to that cliff, Tullins actually. Argument. It's called a modus <laughs> tollens in formal logic. Right. Yeah, we're going to get to that clip in, in just a minute. So I'm going to I'm going to switch up the uh, the order of the questions here, uh, just to stick with this uh, idea of neutrality for a moment. Um, so I'll preface this with this quote from Bonson that uh, I mentioned. I think I mentioned this in uh, in our original dialogue. I got two quotes from Bonson here, and I don't remember which one this one is. But uh, Greg Bonson, who was a disciple of Cornelius Van Til, uh, who was kind of, I guess, the, the father of modern presuppositionalism, as we know it at least. Uh, Bonson said, Since neutrality is unattainable for either the unbeliever or believer, there are no facts or uses of reason which are available outside of the interpretive system of basic commitments or some assumptions which appeals to them. The presuppositions used by Christian and non-Christian determine what they will accept as factual and reasonable, and their respective presuppositions about fact and logic will determine what they say about reality. Now, I think that quote is very important because I want to play another clip uh, of how Dave and Ray Ray, and, and I think this goes straight back to Van Til uh, and Bonson, how they lay out the task of presuppositionalism per se, and what the presuppositionalist is actually trying to do uh, with the unbeliever. So let me uh, pull this clip up, and I know you can't hear it, but I'll, uh, I'll give you the gist of it here when we're, uh, when we're done. I'll nod approvingly as I go along. I want to jump back to this problem. As a presuppositional covenantal apologist, our goal, and I don't think this has got represented really well, and I and I hope if we get another discussion that we get to put this forward, and I'm mm -hmm. sure uh, Dr. Howe, he, he had listened to all of our other shows, which was quite a privilege, yeah. by the way. Thank you. That was an honor. And, and man, we're so grateful uh, Mr. Tucker watched last time. Very thankful for him. Like, feel privileged that he wrote a blog about us, and we'll try to respond. Uh what you do in a covenantal apologetic is you stand on their foundation and you demonstrate its inconsistency, its arbitrariness, and its inability to provide for the preconditions of intelligibility. Because reason alone cannot do that, the position is seen as utter foolishness, deconstructed. Okay, so essentially, Dave is laying out uh, what he thinks the task of presuppositionalism is, and that is to show the person you're talking to that their foundation is bankrupt, uh, it cannot uh, account for reason or the intelligibility of anything that they're talking about, and show you, 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 you essentially show them the impossibility of their view so you can deconstruct their view and then show them uh, the, the Christian view. 
And of course, uh, only the Holy Spirit can do any of this. We're still not exactly sure what role uh, the, the actual conversation plays in this, depending on what what quotation of Bonson you're reading. Uh, and, and we're not denying the role of the Holy Spirit here, but just how precisely that role works. Uh, but I think what, what I think this is pointing to, and again, we talked about this in our original dialogue that I, I think got largely ignored, uh, or at least I know we were chasing a lot of rabbits, so we couldn't cover everything, but it, it goes back to this Cartesian or, or Kantian idea that uh, all knowledge begins in the mind, and we're only knowing our thoughts about reality rather than knowing reality itself. And uh, because of that, our minds are fallen, so we can't think we can know truly anything. We have to rely on the regeneration of the spirit. So that's why Bonson says, you know, neutrality is impossible. Uh, but then he goes on to say that uh, whether you're a, the presuppositions used by the Christian and the non-Christian determine what they will accept as factual and reasonable. And their respective presuppositions about fact and logic will determine what they say about reality. So essentially, it's the worldview glasses that, that people talk about all the time. So let, let's try this again to explain how, in principle, this entire enterprise is self-defeating and utterly bankrupt if, if that is actually uh, the goal in our conversations with unbelievers. Well, you know, it's it almost reminds me for the philosophers out there, almost kind of a uh, Wittgensteinian forms of life and late late Wittgenstein post uh, Tractatus, this idea. Um, so that's just I'm throwing a bone out there to the any philosophy uh, students or whatever. But yeah, it, it becomes self refuting in this respect because if er, if everything that a person goes on to interpret or whatever is determined by their presuppositions then that in effect says, then you can't adjudicate those presuppositions because any argument for this presupposition versus that will itself always be colored by that whatever presupposition is antecedent to that. If they say, well, there aren't any antecedents, presuppositions antecedent to that, then, then either it then becomes arbitrary. So this is my car I drive in and you've got your car and there's no way to judge which car is true because there's nothing back behind the car against which you can appeal and contrast. It's either that, so it becomes arbitrary, or they start creeping up on what we are insisting upon, that the objectivity that is essential for reason at all is the objectivity of reality. And that reality initially, even Van Til says, our proximate starting point cannot be but the finite universe in which we find ourselves. That's that's what Van Til said. Well, of course, we, we start with the universe. Well, that's pretty close to what the classical position has been insisting upon, that, that the things that you initially know are reality, just the, what you see here, taste, touch, or smell. Nobody doesn't do that. That's what we're insisting. And there is nothing back behind reality. There may be something back behind the physical world, well, that's what we try to demonstrate. We start with what we see here, taste, touch, or smell. We can prove the God of, of the Bible exists. Uh, but if you frame it in terms of, <clears throat> well, everybody's method is determined by these antecedent presuppositions, then there's no way to say, then it's just arbitrary then why I have your presuppositions first years. And it wouldn't do for them to go, well, our presuppositions are the only ones that can explain. Well, no. It isn't the case that your presuppositions are the only one explained. It's just the matter that your presuppositional your presuppositions dispose you to say that your presuppositions are the only ones that can explain. Of course, that's the case, but that's true of everybody's presuppositions in a sense. So at, they want their they want to eat their cake and still have it. They want to be able to say ours is the is the undeniable truth about this stuff. But then they frame it in such a way that it robs anybody of the ability to make that adjudication. And, and also, you, you brought up this word that D Bonson uses, uh, this idea of interpretive. I'd like to know what that means. Uh, mm -hmm. So when, when I'm an eight-year-old boy and I walk outside and I see the sun shining, what, what interpretation is going on there? Well, yeah. if you want to say, well, you know, you reason from that to the fact that the sun didn't make itself. There must be some sun maker and everybody knows that to be God. Okay. That's classical apologetics. That's right. what is called a demonstratia quia argument. Um, 
which means the a posteriori. You, you argue from effect to cause. The sun is shining, therefore there's a God who exists with all these uh, attributes of classical theism. That's classical apologetic. If you're not doing that, then then I'm it's a I'm at a loss to know what in the world they could even mean by interpretive that doesn't commit this same self-refuting um, fallacy, if you will, of uh, amputating themselves off from being able to make objective statements. And it won't do again to go well because we're in touch with God, who gives us the objective facts because He's omniscient and we can think God's thoughts after. Well, that whole description then just is your own presupposition right okay and they'll say yes we're presuppositions i go yeah but there's no reason to think that it's true you haven't given any reason why <laughs> well because i can get in your car and show no you can't get in my car and show me anything because you just got through saying everything i'm going to do is according to my presupposition by the way yep. you know what eventually happens if you press this hard enough then they bring in well that's because god's going to have to just step in Okay, mm-hmm. so then just admit that, in a sense, you're a form of fideism. Exactly. That really, all of this is just sort of exercises in futility, and God just uh, uh, imparts faith to his elect and gives them knowledge that they could never have as a creature, and that's the end of the story. And we should just retire the whole conversation about yep. apologetic methods. We don't need a method. The method just is God just does it. Right. Uh, and that kind of starts to scare me because that also— bleeds into biblical interpretation. So yep. now I've heard presuppositionalists more or less claim, well, but we, we know our interpretation is right because the Holy Spirit has confirmed yeah. that. Yeah. I just go, hmm, that starts to sound scary that you've got this, almost this infallible interpreter. That sounds almost uh, Catholic, or it almost sounds cultic, where yep. we've got this insight that the rest of the body of Christ is somehow uh, not, unable to get to. I'm not saying Dave and Ray Ray do that. Sure, do sure. That they, they, that's, it's pointing in that direction. The, not the ideas it. that are being advocated can certainly lead in that direction. Uh, even even uh, it sounds very Mormon to me, almost actually. Just uh, right. the, this it's whole so notion so of fideism, isn't it? Yeah, I don't have to think about anything. Uh, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit made it evident to me. Of course, then, well, I don't know what's the Holy Spirit and not the burritos that I ate last night. You know, I mean, we just we can keep moving the question back. And it's self testing. Um, that. That's right. That's right. Uh, so I don't well, want to uh, myself another cup of coffee into my wonderful SES. Hey, there you go. <laughs> uh, with my uh, yeah, I can't see my SES sticker and stuff on my computer anymore with this view. But uh, so I don't want to leave uh, leave this hanging out there. And I love your brother Tom's uh, Tom House book, Objectivity and Biblical Interpretation, uh, which you can get on on Kindle for for uh, quite cheaply. Uh, but I think he does a, uh, there you go, another product placement. I, I think he does a masterful job of showing that, look, we, we're not denying that everyone has a worldview, so to speak, uh, that we all have a collection of, of things we think are true about reality that inform other things that we think about reality. Uh, of, of course, everyone does that. Uh, what we are denying is that we can't know reality itself. And because we're able... Say say again? Some of reality. Right, 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 right. Uh, And because we're able to do that, then we do have an actual common ground from which to reason. Namely, the laws of logic, the laws of mathematics, I mean, just things we know that are undeniably true about reality. And uh, I was having this conversation via email the other day, uh, yesterday actually, uh, with someone who still just can't quite get this idea that, you know, when when we say that uh, the ability for humans to know truth is about sensible reality uh, is not an assumption, that we're not just assuming for the sake of argument that we're able to do this, nor is it something that we have to prove as if there's some more fundamental thing to argue that the tree exists out there. We're, we're saying it is evident to me that the tree exists or that the sky is blue or that two plus two equals four, whatever the case may be of these first principle kind of things. Uh, and that's true for every human being in all times, in all places. And from that, uh, we're able to have a common ground to actually communicate and to reason about these other things. Is that, uh, would you remotely agree with that or have I, have I totally yeah, butchered and I, that? And I, and I want to just remind our presuppositionalist friends who may be listening 
we know that the, that you make a distinction between common ground and neutral ground, and that in 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 some of the presuppositions literature, they will they acknowledge the fact that no 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 we're not saying there isn't common ground we're saying there isn't neutral ground, but again as uh, that the the distinction between common and neutral is a distinction of set and subset. The, the, the ground over which there is no neutrality is a subset of the grounds over which we have in common. So that, and that's another way of saying there are things about reality that lost people cannot fail to know. And, and so that their, their hostility towards God is not able to erase the faculties that God gave them to know the things that God has created for them to know, uh, even if their fallenness does adversely affect whatever moral response to that fact that they may have, like taking them from there's a tree in the backyard. You cannot fail to know if you're looking at the tree, taking them from that fact, which is common and neutral to an argument known as the cosmological argument to show that God is the creator of that tree. Now that then becomes, you know, hostile to some lost people. But that's fine. That doesn't that doesn't impact. I don't qualify my method just because I know you're not going to like this once you grant the tree. You know, once you admit, but you can't deny that there's a world around you. Then what do you think of this argument? And another thing that comes to mind too, Adam. Uh, and maybe this is all we need to say about it, or we can visit it, it, visit it again, is that some presuppositionalists think it's important to point out that, that some people aren't persuaded by reason. You know? So I think Dave made a comment in, his la- in the last, and I don't know if you got this clip or if there's some side point, but he made a comment about pointing out that, well, people got, find all kinds of things reasonable that you don't think are, well, of course, but suppose we change the discussion from apologetic method and reason to an exegetical dispute over covenant theology versus dispensationalism. Is the covenant theologian supposed to sort of retire his his confidence in covenant theology simply because there are exegetes who come to different conclusions? Is he going to go, well, it's sort of a relativism because there's all kinds of theologies out there. That's kind of what he's doing. He goes, no, what you would do as a covenant theologian is go, look, I'm willing to go to the mat to defend my exegesis and theological assessment of the facts from the scriptures that covenant theology is true. And I, and they would welcome the opportunity to debate, but they know that, well, some people are not going to be persuaded. They're going to stay dispensationalist till Jesus comes back until the rapture comes before the tribulation. <laughs> <laughs> Just sneak in a little bit. Nice. Nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> say it like it's a neutral thing. They'll stay dispensationalist until the pre-tribulation rapture before the 1000 millennial. <laughs> Um, and to I me, this really is the. Go ahead. What? I was going to say to me, this really is the linchpin kind of thing. That I'm sorry, I'm sorry we're we're talking over each other, but the that that this is what to me makes it so dangerous. Uh, just this whole notion of uh, misunderstanding of worldviews, and it's just your perspective, and because uh, it just it, it grants basically the whole show to. Uh, modern philosophy, and yeah. you you end up just in this dog chasing his tail kind of uh, argumentation that well my worldview is better than your worldview, and there's nowhere to go from there other than skepticism or blind faith, and it's and that's that's dangerous. Yeah, no, I, I think you're exactly right because it's not insignificant that if you trace the history of ideas back from Van Til to his uh, antecedents that you find basically the fountainhead most broadly considered in Abraham Kuyper uh, from uh, Free University of Amsterdam, who founded the university, who was prime minister of the Netherlands, who was heavily influenced uh, and in some respects sympathetic to the philosophy, the continental philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Well, Kant just uh, tried to correct philosophical problems that were pseudo-problems, that Hume had more or less exposed the bankruptcy of right. this empiricist tradition and and some aspects of the rationalist tradition from, from Descartes, and that these things were bankrupt and sort of just leaves it at that and has this more or less uh, just colossal skeptical kind of 
specter floating in front of everyone. And so Kant comes along and says, well, here's how we can do damage control and, 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 and salvage the natural sciences. And now you have this tributary of Christian thinking who have bought into that whole mm-hmm. false and erroneous philosophical conversation. And they're offering their presuppositionalism to say, well, how can you know that your inductive reasoning is valid? How can you right. know that technically induction is not valid, but um, informally speaking? How do you know that the future is going to be like the past? They start, uh, how do you know that you're not in the matrix, so to yeah. speak? All yeah. of these are pseudo problems. They're not philosophical problems, strictly speaking. Yeah. They're problems created by bad philosophy. The answers to which were already in place pretty much since the church fathers, as far as how they began to speculate philosophically about these questions. I mean, that's what we would argue as, as Thomas. We're not necessarily here to argue the specific philosophy here. We can do another one podcast if you want on that. But yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm convinced that I just see this going. Bonson does this with Gordon Stein in his debate. And he brings up all these things. Well, Gordon Stein doesn't know the nature of an electron. The very fact that Bonson thinks that Bo- Gordon Stein didn't know what the nature of electron was in order to ground his argument that the future would be like the present and like the past. The very mm-hmm. fact that Bonson thought that is because Bonson didn't think there it was possible to know natures of anything, of anything philosophically right. speaking. <laughs> well, that's that's the problem. His metaphysics is just bad, <laughs> in, in my judgment. Or at least he's granting the wrong metaphysics and trying to fix a problem that's really not there. Right. Should- right. Uh, so let's um let's move on a little bit from there. Even though all these things are interrelated, so we're really not moving on. We're just looking at how that applies to a different aspect of, of presuppositionalism. But uh, so again, sorry you can't hear the clip, but uh, I think you've you've heard it before. But uh, in summarizing the the main differences in our positions, uh, I want to play another uh, about a minute fifteen second clip from uh, Ray Ray from our original dialogue. There's a lot here, but just something specific that I, I do want us to to hone in on as some of our differences exist in the reality that the faith that we are defending must begin with and necessarily include the triune father or the triune god father son and holy spirit who as god condescends to create and redeem god's covenantal revelation is authoritative by virtue of what it is and the christian apologetic will necessarily stand on and utilize that authority in order to defend christianity Um, It is the truth of God's revelation together with the work of the Holy Spirit that brings about a covenantal change from one who is in Adam to one who is in Christ. Those who are and and remain in Adam suppress the truth that they know. Those who are in Christ see the truth for what it is. Uh, There's an absolute covenantal antithesis between Christian theism and any other opposing position. Thus, Christianity is true and anything opposing it is false. Uh, suppression of the truth, like the depravity of sin, is total but not absolute. Thus, every believing position will necessarily have within it ideas, concepts, notions, and the like that has been taken and wrenched from their t- true Christian context. Therefore, it is because of inerrancy we have our, apo- po- our apologetic methodology, inerrancy being a presupposition making an apologetic intelligible, not the other way around. So he's essentially saying that inerrancy is... Uh, the precondition for apologetics, and so we're starting with the triune God of, of Scripture, who's inherently revealed Himself, and and all these sorts of things. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, he he's trying to make an argument for inerrancy and for the truthfulness of Christianity as a whole, uh, but appealing to the law of non contradiction in the process, uh, which which I find uh, fascinating because it's just assumed that obviously anything opposed to this must be false because that's just how reality works, which is what we're saying uh, from, from the get-go. We start with reality. Uh, but there's one thing I really want to focus on. Uh, he says, uh, again, there's a whole lot in that minute and a half, but he, he says that those who remain in Adam suppress the truth that they know, and that those who are in Christ see the truth for what it is. Uh, now, obviously, he's you know somewhat alluding to Romans 1, among other places, but... Uh, what do you think of this particular way of thinking about the issue? Well, two things, I think, uh, uh, come to mind to me. One, okay, granted, the Scripture says in Romans, basically Romans uh, 1, verses 18 through 21, that, uh, uh, that what is known of God uh, is manifest and that we suppress that truth and unrighteousness. Fine. But what 
uh, the presuppositionalist needs to do is read the rest of the chapter of Romans 1, which they don't seem to factor in with the same level of uh, significance for this question that they do of these uh, this point in Romans 1, 18 through 21. And that is that having suppressed this truth, and, and by the way, just to interrupt myself, which I like to do uh, as often as I can, um, one could have a conversation as to whether or not what Paul is outlining in Romans 1 and Romans 2 is absolute. That is, every, it, it applies to every person without exception, or it's, it's a different kind of universal that it applies to everyone without distinction. And the Reformed uh, Christians in the audience should uh, celebrate that I acknowledge that distinction, uh, uh, all without exception or all without distinction. Um, or if it's making just sort of a general statement. And the reason I bring it up is uh, they seem to have no problem universalizing everybody suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. But yet I've never heard a presuppositionalist acknowledge, go on to say, and all unbelievers are homosexual, which is what Paul argues, in effect, if you take this as universal, because he does say this is the cascade into the darkness where the God gives them over to reprobate mind and they give up the natural use of the woman. Well, I don't know any presupposition that says all the unbelievers are homosexual. Yet, if you make verses 18 through 21 suppress the truth and unrighteousness absolutely without exception, then I'm curious hermeneutically how all of a sudden you can qualify their, the homosexuality later in the chapter. That's just an aside point. Let's just take it as sort of a general indictment in, in the vein of the general indictment that Israel rejected the Messiah, but it didn't mean Paul rejected the Messiah, even though he's an Israelite. That's the difference between general, uh, just taking things generally. Generally speaking, Israel rejected the Messiah, even though Peter was an Israelite and he didn't, and Paul was an Israelite and he didn't. All right. So given that, back to your, your question, what they need to go on to do, this is the first of the two things, is finish the rest of the chapter as to how Paul characterizes this indictment of the human race, because after he says that we suppress the truth and unrighteousness, then in verse 23, it says that we change the glory of the incorruptible God into the corruptible. Then in verse 25, it says we exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And then he ends the chapter in verse 28 as, and then did not consider retaining the knowledge of God. So what begins with a suppression of truth ends up being a rejection of truth, where it's no longer in their knowledge. That's why Paul could call the Galatians atheists. The Greek word, when it's translated in probably most English, you were without God in the world. The Greek word there is atheists. Literally, they were atheists. They were without God. Uh, well, they weren't without God ontologically, because God is holding them in existence. They were without God in terms of their knowledge, and they certainly were without God in terms of their response to the knowledge. So the second thing is uh, uh, there's an odd kind of uh, inverse from what their model would suggest. Compare, um, uh, let's say, 1 Corinthians 8 with Romans 10. So 1 Corinthians 8, Paul is talking about and I need to thank Adam for pointing this out to me. So you need to maybe help me fill in some of the specifics here as I just kind of throw this out. Um, Adam Tucker, that is. Um, and that Paul is trying to inst instruct the Corinthians about the propriety and lack thereof of eating meat sacrificed to idols. And he's basically saying, look, these idols aren't real. There aren't any other gods. There's only one true God. And so the point is, it doesn't matter to eat meat sacrificed to a non-existing God. There's nothing there. So don't worry about it. But he goes on to add, not all have this knowledge. He's talking to the Christians in Corinth, the, the saved people, that some of the people who were saved hadn't got to the point that they knew that there was only just the one God. And they were in their weakness laboring under this burden of being sort of held accountable and, in, and endangered by these idols, these other gods to whom this meat was sacrificed. And so Paul says, well, you know, some of them just hadn't gotten there yet. They don't really know that. Well, wait a minute. I thought Romans 1, 18 through 21 says, all men who are lost know this. But now the Corinthians who are saved don't know this. That seems to be a, a conflict 
in terms of how Romans 1, 18 through 21 is even characterized. It's even odder when you compare that to Romans 10, the, in the end of chapter 9 into the beginning of chapter 10, when Paul mm -hmm. characterizes the nation of Israel who rejected Christ as their Messiah as having a zeal for God, mm. but not according to knowledge. Right. Notice that Paul doesn't say, well, they've exchanged the true God for a false God because they weren't Trinitarian or they didn't see Jesus the Messiah. But after all, Jesus said, if you, if you don't believe me, then if you don't have me, you don't have the Father. He didn't do any of that theologically. He acknowledged the fact that the God that they uh, uh, did not did not uh, uh, follow, uh, but nevertheless had a zeal for, was the true God. The knowledge that they lacked was a knowledge that they should have gotten from their own Tanakh in uh, the life of Abraham. And that was the knowledge that righteousness before God is only by grace through faith. And that goes back to Abraham. It actually goes back before the fall. Uh, so it's not really a plan B because of the fall. There is no there is no covenant of works. It's always been by grace, even before the fall. Man's good has always been but by God's grace. But uh, it's that, you know, zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, because they uh, seeking to establish their own righteousness, refuse to submit themselves to the righteous of God. So there you've got people with a zeal for the right God who lack some knowledge about how they're supposed to respond in faith. You've got people in Corinth who are saved, who still don't have the proper knowledge of God. And you got people in Romans 1 who are lost that knew God all at the same time. <laughs> you got to be able to have a coherent theological accounting uh, of these things in order to then try to make extrapolations into some apologetic methodology. And in my judgment, the presuppositionalist just flat out doesn't do this. They yeah. just they just they just jump on and they, they take a point. Romans one of everybody knew God, and they're off and running. Go, whoa, 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 slow down. Uh, last, and I brought this point up during our dialogue with with uh, Dave and Ray Ray, uh, and I, I believe this sincerely, uh, just as a as a personal thing. I think some presuppositionalists, whether this applies to Dave and Ray Ray, they'll have to decide. I, I can't say that. I'm just saying this as a matter of principle. I think there are some presuppositionalists who have been mistakenly who have mistakenly concluded that presuppositional apologetics is required by their covenant reform theology. Mm. So when we are arguing against their apologetic method, we are in effect, in their view, asking them to retire their covenant reform theology. Right. But I think there's enough counterexamples to that, both historically, from Calvin onward, through the Puritans, through the Princeton Giants, through people like Sproul, Gerstner, Killen, others we can name. There are enough counterexamples of that to show that's just not true. You can have this debate over apologetic methodology in a way that is important, in important ways, indifferent to the specifics of covenant theology. Now, I know that makes Scott Oliphant, you know, just break out in a rash for me to say that. But I just appeal not only to the philosophical arguments that we can have, but also to this, the, just the empirical evidence of covenant theologians who are, in fact, Coven, uh, classical in their apologetic method. Right, right. Yeah, I want to point out just three real, real quick things. And, you know, you and I have talked about this before, but, uh, you know, I, I could totally be uh, misunderstanding this because I'm certainly not a uh, Bible scholar by any means. But I think there's at least uh, a notion to, to point out that, you know, there's a difference in God making something evident to people versus everyone knowing that immediately. So, you know, you and I talked about the, the speed limit sign, you know, the, the, the government or whoever has made that very evident to everyone driving down the highway. But if someone's not paying attention or whatever the case may be, they may miss it, but they're still held responsible for that because it was evident to them. The government had made it so, uh, but the fact still remains that they missed it. Not that they were incapable of seeing it, they just missed it for whatever reason, uh, and you know I think common it's just a commonsensical understanding of uh, of the way our minds work and the way culture works to see that as a culture deteriorates and as uh, bad thinking 
gains ground and good training and education deteriorates as well, then obviously the thinking of that society is going to deteriorate at the same time. And if that includes good philosophy and thinking well about things that are made, then it's still evident to everyone, but people may not have the capacity for whatever reason to uh, think rightly uh, about those things. And they're still held responsible. That's a great, great point. Now, who was it? I think it's, you shared with me some, maybe like a C.S. Lewis or somebody that had used the idea that, well, the sun is shining, but if you're going to close your eyes. That was Aquinas. Not the sun's fault. What's that? It was Aquinas. It was Aquinas. Oh, how, how could I have gotten that wrong? <laughs> uh, you know, the man. Uh, yeah. So that's a, and, and, and as, I, as you describe that, it sort of makes me think of how we have made similar indictments on the deterioration of our culture, specifically as Americans, if not Western culture more broadly, morally speaking. Mm-hmm. And we see ourselves as Christians as salt and light in that respect, namely to be uh, uh, the, a voice of moral sanity within a culture that isn't necessarily Christian. So as I've often said in some other contexts, I don't think we have the luxury to wait until every American gets saved before we have a discussion about abortion or right. the sanctity of marriage. Exactly. That God has set it up in a way that there are things about morality that the lost man is obligated to recognize even in his lostness. Yep. And he's held accountable for that. And it's not a counterexample to my point saying, yeah, well, some people think child molestation is, is, is rational. Fine. Some yeah. people think a lot of things that they're thinking are, wrongly. <laughs> right. And, but it, I don't retire exegesis only because I think there are bad exegetes like exactly finish Jennings date or finest Jennings date or somebody. Yeah. So it seems like a parallel, doesn't it? To, at least to me, it does yeah, between I think so. what we're already used to discussing morally. And now what you're pointing out from Aquinas about what's happening as we see now in our day intellectually. Yeah. And, and rationally speaking, that there's this rational deterioration that we've got to be salt and light at that level. That's what classical apologetics is best equipped to do. Right. The presuppositional method is basically just running from that, running from that. And I, yeah. I, I listen to these guys debate. I listen to them on YouTube as many as I can find in stomach at the time, depends on what I'm doing. And they they just seem to be just manifestly failing in the task. I would sure, be an atheist. Too, at times. I don't deny that, but I'm just saying it isn't the case that the presuppositionalism just right there and that people are just, yeah. shadows are falling and people are getting, it, it, in fact, I think it's less persuasive. It's I think it's an object of ridicule. Um, uh, absolutely. An, an, an occasion for people to, to mock. Uh, the if that's that, all I had to listen to, I, I would probably be an atheist if that's all I had uh, as a defense of the truthfulness of Christianity. Uh, and if I may say this, Adam, uh, because I know you, you and I agree on this, uh, they may say, well, look, I've, I've heard a lot of these people debate, they're classical apologists, and they don't seem to be making any in, inroads either. So, you know, uh, right back at you kind of thing. <laughs> but, but I'll say this and then defend it maybe under on another occasion. What you almost never find in my, at least from where I'm sitting, what you almost never find in the broad apologetic theater out there is the Thomists arguments. And I hear right. those atheists going, well, you know, we're going to refute the argument for God's existence. They have no clue what Aquinas's argument is. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's not that they have a clue and they don't. It never gets introduced into the. Yeah. The, the, and it's not something eccentric. This sort of classical tradition has largely defined the way Christians have always thought since, <laughs> since the church fathers, not just some burp on the history of ideas. Right. And I, I'm not saying that makes it true. I'm just saying at least consider this. Yeah, it's relevant, just, if nothing else. Yeah, just before you just repudiate the whole thing with one, sure. oh, well, you know, that's just autonomous human reason or some talking. <laughs> that's just right. Yeah. Uh, the, the other just really two quick things I want to point out, and we'll move on from this point, is – uh, to say that uh, it is only those who are in Christ who now understand things truly. Uh, again, I think that goes back to your point of that's how you head down the, the cultic route because 
I think I'm in Christ. I think you are too. And we're having significant disagreement with Dave and Ray Ray in this case, of course, uh, as brothers, we're not disputing that whatsoever. Uh, but, you know, we, we have differing opinions on uh, particular passages of Scripture, obviously apologetic methodology, philosophical foundations, all these sorts of things. So if all we have to appeal to is the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, then there's zero way we can adjudicate any of these things. And that's exactly how cults are born, as, as you were uh, mentioning earlier. And uh, just the last point I want to make, uh, make, and I won't pay, play this clip or uh, we, we won't belabor this, but I just thought it was interesting, and I think it plays into to what we're talking about right now. Uh, you know, we talked about 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 10. Uh, we can look at um, Paul in uh, Acts when they were thinking that he, he and Barnabas were Zeus and Hermes or whoever, you know, and he's appealing to uh, God bringing rain and all this sort of stuff, Acts 17, to the unknown God and, and all of this. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very big talking point in presuppositionalism to, well, look how they did it in the Bible. We got to go to the Bible to get our, our method and we got to go to the Bible to get our everything else. Of course, you know, I would say, well, I don't go to the Bible to get how to do brain surgery or how to send somebody to the moon or those sorts of things. So uh, what exactly is the everything else that you're talking about there? But specifically with methodology in this in this instance, uh, just look at First Corinthians eight specifically. You know, Paul's talking about believers there. Now he's had some harsh words for believers on occasions who were in sin and, and different things, uh, but he's not, at least as far as far as what we have recorded, he's not addressing them with, "Come on, guys, you knew this before you were a Christian. You know that you know X Y Z about God, and you've known it your whole life." And uh, he doesn't do any of that. And, and Dave made a specific point in our original dialogue that he had done this exhaustive study of, of Acts. I forget the specific type of uh, study that he mentions that he had done, and there were 25 sermons. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's doing twenty analysis of these 25 sermons, and nowhere are they, you know, arguing for the existence of God, or is Paul spending all this time uh, reasoning with people and making arguments so that they eventually come to his conclusions, and I, I, you and I talked about this a bit afterwards, but I'm thinking, are we reading the same Acts? Uh, because Paul is meeting people where they are, and for the most part, they all believed in God, so why would he make any arguments for God's existence? Uh, but he's constantly reasoning with people and persuading people and spending years in places doing this uh, at, at times. So uh, I, I just thought that was a bit misleading and something we didn't really talk about in our uh, original dialogue. So just any any thoughts you want to add about yes. that? Yeah, so several things. One, um the context in which Paul and the apostles find themselves in Acts is basically a culture saturated with people who believe in the existence of God, not the God of the Bible, not the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, not even necessarily the creator God uh, specifically, but just a kind of generic theism or polytheism, uh, if you will. So at some level, arguing for the existence existence of God is not to be found because people didn't have a problem with the existence of God or gods. They had a problem with whether the God that Paul preached was the true God or not. Well, that's that's not that's not that's not a theistic argument kind of need there. What you need there is how do we adjudicate claims of deity uh, uh, among all these different gods who may claim or their disciples who may claim their God. Second, you know, I think he said that uh, he noticed that Paul never appealed to things outside of the Bible. Well, first of all, there wasn't a Bible beyond the Tanakh when Paul is preaching in Acts. So you can't it can't be the New Testament. Uh, and before Abraham, there wasn't even a Tanakh. And I mean, before Moses, especially, there wasn't even what we would call an Old Testament. So there was no Bible as a as a book that was codified according to which people could make their uh, appeal. But it's right. just factually false that Paul didn't appeal to things outside of Acts. I mean, outside of the Bible, uh, uh, granting this this caveat about what I said about Bible. For example, in Acts 14, Paul is uh, talking about how God did not leave himself without witness. Well, what does Paul appeal to as the witness that God did not leave himself without? It was not an appeal to Scripture. It was appeal to providence. That God, you know, uh, uh, he brings the rain and the seasons and he gives us fruit right. and vegetables and, you know, these kind of staples of life. And the fact that God superintends 
the affairs of humans on the planet, irrespective of any kind of revealed truth, that was a general revelation revealed truth through history and through providence. So that's something that's outside of Scripture. In Acts 17, in, in, in Mars Hill, in the Areopagus, Paul explicitly references a Greek poet named Aratus in a book called The Phenomena, when he says, uh, and we are all uh, uh, of his offspring, mm-hmm. is a direct quote from the invocation to Zeus out of Aratus's uh, Phenomena, which you can get the English translation of today and find that quote. And he, and he acknowledges that that's what he's doing when he says, as, as also some of your own poets have said. Right. Quote. So he's appealing to a common ground, maybe neutral ground, Greek poet about uh, two to three hundred years before that his hearers knew that he appeals to them to make his point about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That wasn't the point that the guy was making in his book. You know, so they do yeah. that. Well, Aristotle, you know, he's talking about this. That, yeah, Aristotle is the God of Aristotle is not the God. But the things that Aristotle says, I can argue some of those things he says are true of the God of the right. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just like the the uh, things that uh, Aratus says about Zeus are true about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Paul uses that common connection. So right there are, are two. Maybe we could find more if we took the yeah. time to go through. But sure. even still, uh, there's no obligation that our method has to be constrained to the way Paul actually preached in terms of his context with how he addressed Jews and then Greeks and then Romans, because it may very well be if you're talking to a Zulu in South Africa or a, uh, or a some kind of Sikh in, in the Far East, that your method may have to take into consideration the very assumptions and presuppositions that we make such a big deal out of that mm-hmm. might be scandalizing their ability to even understand the gospel. You know, uh, uh, when, when Jesus gives the parable of the seeds and the soils and the first seed falls on the rocky ground and then he interprets that parable, he says this and the birds of the air come and take the seed. He said, these are the ones that hear the word of the kingdom and do not understand it. So I see one of the tasks of the apologist is to try to help people understand what we mean by what we say, by God's mm-hmm. grace. Mm-hmm. And that's what high school apologetics excels at, is highlighting where are you being scandalized by false views of reality that right. we can correct. And that's not presuppositional. That's just reason is what that <laughs> is. That's just reasoning to the to your fellow human being with the faculties that God has created us to have as human beings, that even the fall hasn't eradicated, even if it's sort of effaced it. It hasn't, as Norm Geiser would say, erased it. Right, right. Uh, there, there's so much to cover. We'll have to do this again. And, you know, we're, we're hoping to have a part two with Dave and Ray Ray. And that was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, some, some other dialogues with, with some other presuppositionalists. Uh, again, because I, I do think this is, is so important. And for whatever reason, uh, so much apologetics in, in, lot of, in a lot of evangelical circles uh, seems to be presuppositional or, or pseudo presuppositional at least uh in in at least some of the the circles i'm familiar with uh so it is something we want to uh to address but i want to close on, on this point because I, I want it to be absolutely clear obviously again there's so much we could dive into to, to clear up things that have probably been, been misunderstood just from our conversation today uh but i at least want to be absolutely clear that uh none of this uh, is meant to diminish the role that the Holy Spirit plays. And we said this in our original dialogue as well, uh, that, that we're saying that our argumentation and, and reasoning and those sorts of things are simply the occasion upon which the Holy Spirit moves in someone's life uh, to draw them to himself. Um, and I, I think we, we mentioned that in one of the blogs that we wrote as well. But uh, you made this point in the dialogue, and again, I don't think it was fully grasped, but I want to read another quote from Bonson that I think is related uh, and, and hopefully will we'll give some context as to why as far as the role of the Holy Spirit, if we're uh, if we're being biblical, what I think is biblical at least, we're not terribly far off. We're just saying one thing is the occasion that the Holy Spirit uses rather than another. Uh, as Bonson says, the unregenerate cannot be logically maneuvered into Christian faith, 
but requires a complete change of paradigm and lifestyle, which again goes back to our the presuppositional uh, approaches completely impossible in principle, uh, if this is the case. Such can be affected only by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. Without our apologetic, the Holy Spirit's influence would be blind power. Without the Holy Spirit, our apologetic would be meaning uh, would be meaningful but impotent. I, I, I don't think we're necessarily that far off in what we're saying as far as the role of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I think we're just saying that the Holy Spirit uses classical apologetics, argumentation, appealing to people's uh, humanity, essentially, uh, as the occasion upon which to reach them, which in principle is the same thing Bonson is saying. We use our presuppositional apologetic, which we've shown as self-defeating in principle, uh, but still, that is the occasion upon which the Holy Spirit draws people to himself. So what what is being missed uh, as far as uh, this idea that that it's reason alone, where we think we can reason people to God, and we can reason all the truths there are about God, and, and all of this sort of stuff, and there's no need for special revelation, there's no need for the gospel, there's no need for the Holy Spirit, just these vast misunderstandings uh, of the yeah, classical exactly. position. What What's going on here? Yeah, so it, it does harken back, I think, to uh, overlooking the distinction between uh, uh, the lost man's knowledge of some objective fact about creation— uh, that God made and God made the the man who is lost and God made those faculties. And it's a confusion of that with the uh, important and more important aspect of how the lost man responds to that because he's in a state of enmity with God and he's in, he's in a state of aversion. We just we argue because it seems to be just so obvious, I'm just baffled sometimes that people would question this, that there are truths about creation that the lost man cannot fail to know. OK, we're not saying every truth about creation. We're certainly not saying every spiritual truth. We're, and, and we're not saying that he never rebelled. We're not denying all of those things. We're just acknowledging. But. There are things that the fall has not removed the lost man's ability to know intellectually or to know uh, by the faculties. That that's that's the common ground. Uh, the the question of man's response to that is never the task of the apologist to begin with, I, any more than it's the task of the evangelist. All of us hopefully recognize that it only is by the grace of God through his working in a person's heart through the Holy Spirit that a person is able to come to a point where they come to the light. You know, the Bible says all men love darkness and they don't come to the light. Well, that doesn't mean no one ever gets saved, does it? Of course not. It means that left to our own devices, we would never come to God. We need this work of the Holy Spirit. We're saying, well, one of the means by which he not only can, but actually has. I mean, we know people this has happened to. I heard a presuppositionalist recently on, on YouTube who was criticizing my dialogue or my interview with Cameron Bertuzzi on capturing Christianity. And uh, and he, he made some comment. No one's ever come to Christ by this philosophy and reason. I was like, I know people that have done this. Both famous people that I know that have done this because I've read their testimony, like, say, Mortimer Adler, for example, who was in a secular Jew Aristotelian who became a Thomist, who became a Christian, all because of this philosophical trick. You can read his his testimony uh, there. So we know this happens. We know God has used this. So uh, I'm not sure what uh, the presuppositionist is trying to stave off, what it is that he's trying to... Uh, to argue against, because it's a fact that people have gotten saved through the classical method, and it's a fact that God uses this method. And so then we would argue that the alternative, by the way, you've mentioned several times, and we've unpacked a little bit, that it's self-refuting, because if everybody comes at it from their own rebellious presuppositions, then you can't get in their car and show them anything, because they're right. always going to well, the Holy Spirit has to do it. OK, well, then the Holy Spirit has to do that for everybody, which means then the classical method, if it takes the Holy Spirit, no matter what, 
then that's no then that just means that classical method could work just as well as any other uh, uh, method. Uh, but but now I've lost my train of thought. But at any rate, it probably wasn't. Uh, oh no, I'm radioactive. That's what it was. I'm <laughs> the audience that I, to stay ten feet away. Uh, but but uh, uh, this this uh, uh, well, I think I've said it o- over and over again. We 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 we've indicted them as being self refuting. Our method has actually been used of God. There's there's uh, no reason to think that it doesn't comport with reason, and there's there's every reason to think that there are truths about reality that humans cannot fail to know. Oh, I know what I was going to say. It, it happens. When I was younger, I got it back pretty quickly. Now it takes me about 34 seconds. <laughs> that is that uh, I would like to know, and if the presuppositionalist comes along and says, well, look, God is the epistemological precondition of knowledge, or the presupposition of God is epistemological, pre- however they want to word it. I want to know, well, why should I think that's true? Well, I recently heard an interview with Scott Oliphant, and he was asked directly, so what is the argument? Tell me what the argument is. Uh, and what Scott did was repeat the conclusion. Well, because without God, you could. Yeah. And so the, the interviewer who was a presupposition. OK, so if you were in a debate with an atheist, what would be like a syllogism that you would give? <laughs> what I was reminded of, and I invite people to go back and listen to it. Listen to the debate that R.C. Sproul and, and uh, Greg Bonson had. And listen to John Richard DeWitt's, I think it's his very first, the very first question that's asked in the Q&A. And John Richard DeWitt was a uh, professor of systematic theology at Reform Seminary, may still be there for all I know. And he said, I'm going to take the prerogative of the moderator and ask the first question. And the question, and maybe it was a question he asked later on, but it's somewhere uh, Dr. DeWitt asked Bonson, how is this an argument? Mm-hmm. I think Bonson was sort of taken aback by that. Like, I'm not sure what you mean. He said, I understand you're saying, and then he states the presuppositionalist position, but how is that an argument? That's a statement of the position. What is your argument for it? I want to know what the argument, I've never found the argument. Mm-hmm. I just find the position stated over and over. Well, God is a precondition of, without the interpretive framework. Well, why should I think that's true? If I just said, well, that's just not true. What's your argument? And it can't be, well, it's the impossibility of the contrary. That can't be it. Because if if I'm if I'm uh, being irrational because of my lostness, I won't know that the contraries can't both be true. Right. Right. I'm using the laws of logic, which, by the way, Scott Oliphant says are created mm. by God. And that why can't God resolve a bona fide contradiction? He says in his book, why can't he? I go, wow, this is this is getting scary. Uh, yeah. Scary. That's a yeah. whole different issue we can get in in the next. Yeah. Time next time and for the record contraries uh cannot both be true but they can both be false the impossibility of the contradiction is what needs to be proven if that is actually going to be uh, logically correct uh, well dropping the ball there that he says the impossibility of the contrary doesn't true true prove your position because two contraries could both be false as you as you just said exactly (laughs) good point uh, well, this is an hour and a half, probably enough that anybody that is listening uh, this long, uh, you probably need a doctor, but um, that's probably all they care to hear for today. So, uh, so much more to get into, and uh, we'll have to do it again. And as always, it is a pleasure, Dr. Howe. Pleasure is all mine, Adam. Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Stay healthy. You too. Well, thank you again for joining us uh, for this episode of Why Do You Believe Live? Uh, Presup Redux is what we were titling it. And uh, hopefully we'll have some more conversations along these lines and uh, have some more dialogues uh, about presuppositionalism and, and many other topics. Of course, we're not going to just focus on this, but uh, an important one to, to have and uh, just so many nuanced uh issues to be discussed that that sometimes it takes a while but uh thank you for listening and as always if you're interested in uh, learning more about how you can study at ses whether that be in a degree program or one of our four credit certificates you can visit ses.edu uh, to learn all about that dr howe is actually teaching a uh, apologetic systems class right now uh so too late to get into this particular class but uh, many other awesome classes coming up that you can get into and of course he'll be teaching that again in the near future uh, and as always ses uh, completely relies on generosity of uh, our donor base 
case, uh, student tuition, of course, but tuition is not nearly enough to cover everything uh, that it takes to run an institution. So uh, any way that you can support us, whether that be financially, whether that be prayerfully or whatever the case may be, again, you can visit ses.edu to learn more. Uh, this video will also be on YouTube and uh, will be, the audio will be available as a podcast on the SES mobile app, which again, you can find on our website, uh, how to download that if you don't have it already. So until next time, uh, hopefully we'll see you soon and God bless. Providing an integrated approach to theology, philosophy, and apologetics that will equip you to proclaim the gospel, engage the culture, and defend the truth. That's SES.